Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the conference call of Citadel Bank and to the guest speaker event of Riga Business School. Uh, I think we are starting to start a tradition. I think this will be a unique event where we have students and policy makers and university leadership together in one room talking about what is modern in um, higher education curriculum and higher education programs. And before I get into further detail about that, I am very thankful part why this event could happen was the work of Latvian government and the work of Latvian finance industry uh, to start the Baltic IT leadership program. And one of the supporters for that program is Bank Citadel. And also the Bank Citadel is a supporter of this event and that's why we are here. And I would like to invite the host, uh, <laughs> I apologize, the host, the board member of Bank Citadele, Slovomir Mizak, to address you and say a few welcome words before we get into the program. Thank you, Yanis. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Citadele. Citadele is the bank where the innovation is in our DNA. We try to always look at things differently, how we are able to bring best products, best services, best user experience to our customers. The interdisciplinary and very unique program what RBS created with the University of Buffalo is bringing, I think, great opportunities for the young people in the region. And this kind of approach, I believe, is the best to prepare young people for the real life. It's not just the pure theory. This is the combination of the different disciplines which will make you more comfortable once you are stepping out to the real world. Therefore, we are uh, proud to be the partner of the RBS and to contribute to the education of you guys, new leaders and the new innovators. I'm convinced and I believe that some of you will become my colleagues very soon. And uh, yeah, I wish you a very successful and interesting event today. Welcome once again. And now uh, the concept what we want to bring into Latvia is uh, that every year from now on we'll try to bring one speaker from um, one of the top higher education institutions around the world to address different audiences in Latvia. And today's event is between the policy administrators and students. The next one will be with the business people and the last one will be a little bit different that we look at interdisciplinarity from different perspectives. And in order for that to happen, we have a very honored speaker whom um, as we know, as we see from her CV, she has she is an interdisciplinary person of her own. She has uh, degrees in economics, psychology, create management, architecture, behavioral science and design, and uh, human computer interaction. And I think that's, to me, and also the students, that's a very, very diverse list from which to choose how you combine a modern leadership individual. And I think for those policy makers and leaders of the universities, we have to look at that and say, okay, how do we provide our students with that experience? That, that they succeed in the world of really being of interdisciplinary nature. And I think that is what we will start the discussion today, what the new IT program is all about. And therefore, it's my honor to welcome to the stage kind of representative of one of the high monikers of higher education of the world. It's the University of Harvard. And welcome to the stage. Bess, Bess Altringer, I apologize, <laughs> Bess Altringer, who is a faculty member at the School of Engineering. So and that, those for you who are from engineering schools, remember I didn't mention that she had a degree in engineering, but she works for School of Engineering as a professor. 
So I think as uh, higher education reforms in Latvia is in progress, we have a lot to learn how to build a very modern institution with um, policies, procedures, and so on. And uh, Bess Altringer is a professor at University of Harvard School of Engineering. She is also one of the uh, brains behind an interesting project called Chef League. Well, she tries to work on DNA of foods. And also she works on the question, which is, I think, very interesting and very fundamental. Why do people like things? Among them, food, Uber, I guess, suchy and suchy. And that's where she does her work in an institution called Desirability Lab. How do you make something to be desired by your customers, by public, and so on? And I think today's this morning's topic is more on how do we get that all together in young people's heads so as we develop them in true leaders for the global, na for the global world. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. It's so good to be here. Thank you for having me from all the way in Boston. Um, I never imagined that I would uh, even go to school at Harvard. I grew up on a goat farm in Idaho. <laughs> I don't know if anyone here knows where Idaho is, but it's very, very small within the US, and moved to Arizona. I applied to one university. It was a state school in Arizona. and it's just so cool that at this stage of my life, I get to not only go to Harvard, <laughs> but I get to help shape our, our curriculum. And so today, we're going to be just telling the story this morning of how we have been integrating innovation education throughout Harvard's curriculum, but I'm going to give you the point of view specifically from the engineering school. So roughly, this is the, the, what we're going through. We're going to talk about how we saw early on that the economy was changing and that what employers and students wanted out of their education was changing. We went through a little study validating those different changing needs and then began um, integrating innovation education in throughout the university. And we've been experiencing very rapidly growing demand in these areas, which I'll go over. And then we began to build an ecosystem to support this. I'll talk a little bit about how we have done that and then give some specific examples um, from our context, a little bit about evaluating what we've been doing, and um, we'll start with the needs. This is actually an image of the classroom that I teach in in 1901. Uh, this classroom doesn't look very similar today, uh, but it's not that long ago that it looked kind of like this. And uh, what we're trying to do now, so this is um, the Harvard Innovation Lab, is a, an institute that we built. We started it in 2011, and uh, it launched in 2012. And this was really, really new for our context. This is open to students from all over the, inter the university. It wasn't specific to engineering students or business students or design students. And it's been very successful. So 20% of the entire university population uses the iLab every year. We have venture incubation programs. We've incubated over 1,000 teams. Each year, we incubate about 75 uh, to 90 teams. We have a 30% acceptance rate. So these are student, um, student startups. And we have special programs that help launch their startups to a higher level than they're likely to be able to do on their own. 70% uh, of the founders of this, of the, at the iLab are not from Harvard Business School. So we're training a lot of founders from throughout the university. About half of them are women, which is unusual still in this context. And this is probably the most exciting statistic, but um, since 2011, student startups that have been incubated in the iLab have raised over $600 million. Uh, 
So we're pretty excited about that shift from that initial classroom to where we are today. So back up to 2011, which incidentally is also when I joined Harvard. So how might we move from this type of classroom to one that is focused on educating better for a multidisciplinary uh, creative problem solving approach? Whether we're talking about training people for entrepreneurship, building their own companies, or intrapreneurship, where they are building uh, entrepreneurial ventures inside of other companies. How do we begin to train for that better than we've been doing in the past? So we could see that leaders um, agreed that innovation is important for economic competitiveness, but we also can, we know that failure happens frequently. It's about 70 to 90% of the time in um, startups. We could see rapidly growing student interest in the areas of innovation, entrepreneurship, design, um, and all of these sort of intersections. And that has increased something like 11-fold since the 1990s. And it's happening not, in the, not just in the US, but we're seeing similar shifts happen in Canada. Um, we also could see that there's a gap between uh, what these students want uh, in terms of being prepared for innovative work and what their preparedness levels were from the perspective of employers. So a few key uh, career landscape changes are happening. One is we have an increase of project-based uh, careers. So these are students spending, no, professionals spending sort of two years at a company and then moving on and then moving on. This might be different than, than your context here, but that's what we're seeing more and more of in, in the US. Um, and company lifespans are a lot shorter than they used to be. And then our careers, of course, are a lot longer. Um, and yet our education system is often still training for an industrial uh, age. So we needed to move that forward to training for an entrepreneurial age. So this is an example of an interview. Um, this is a real, from a real interview. The interviewer says to, this is a, a computer science grad who should be very easy to employ in many ways. And the interviewer asks, tell me about a time um, that you took an abstract idea and made it concrete. And thus, uh, CS grad says, I made a game with some other students, and the interviewer wants to know a little bit more about that, be more specific, and the student says, we had the requir requirements planned out, uh, and we responded to those requirements creatively. And the reviewer uh, decided that this is a failed interview and really wanted that answer to have been better thought out. And specifically, what they're saying is that people that they're seeing apply are not getting enough of a critical skill um, skill set of how do you put an idea forward, put the facts behind it, and support it, and build it. And they want to see more students coming through that are doing that, that are capable of organizing ideas. Um, from Google, there are a few different ways that, that a few different non-intuitive things that they look for in hiring. So they want to find people who are able to step back and embrace other people's ideas when those ideas are better. They want to see a lack of a fundamental attribution error. So this is where when things are going very well, you think that you must be brilliant. And uh, when things are not going very well, you blame it on someone else. They want people who can argue fiercely, but can also adapt to new information and are able to process information on the fly. So very similar to what uh, we saw in the last example. So it seems pretty obvious that we should be training better for that abstract process of organizing ideas. But how do you do that when your default is set up in departments that are different, that are siloed differently, in classes that are uh, separated? We, like, how do we begin to integrate this system to better to teach for this set of skills. So the first thing we did was test some of this out. It seemed like this was suggesting that we need to change our system. 
So we did a uh, human-centered design study where we interviewed a lot of people, over uh, 100 different people from different universities, to learn what all is out there in terms of integrated programs that are focused on these types of skills. And what we could see uh, on one of these access axes is uh, problems that have fully knowable answers. And, um, and the other is uh, problems that the professors uh, can know the answers for. So a lot of, even when we have problem uh, focused classes that the students get to be quite free in figuring out the answer, um, professors can be uncomfortable sometimes not knowing the answers to the, the problems that they're setting up. So what we see is that both for faculty and for students, we end up in a place where we are uh, happiest when we're within one discipline, when projects have known answers. And uh, the problem is that students rarely get uh, experience in the process of having to really define and decide what they should do next uh, in terms of organizing uh, new ideas. And where we want to be moving is where we have more multidisciplinary, open-ended types of problems where students are practicing that art of having to define the problem, decide what to do next, defend their, um, their choices. So over here we have more traditional and predictable, and over here we have uh, predictable and well-liked. Um, but the issue is that our traditional academic incentives are sort of discouraging um, the type of in innovation that we want to be creating in the university. How do we get out of that? So we have some initial challenges to address. We needed to figure out how do we even begin to teach for multidisciplinary creative problem solving uh, for a collaborative approach. So we were really great at training individuals, but now we need to be training uh, people in team skills that are appropriate for this. How do we teach for managing uncertainty? Um, how do we make the experience primarily about the students uh, instead of what faculty are interested in? Um, how do we work with and uh, adapt to students' needs as their ideas develop? Often at the beginning of a class, uh, the students' ideas are very different than, than they might be at the end of the class. How do we support that in real time? And how do we work with students' expectations of a pretty different type of class? So this is not a very predictable world anymore if we're teaching um, these kinds of classes. And our students often really want to know how to get an A. And it's harder to tell them how to get an A in this type of class. So this coupled with that statistic of currently 70 to 90% of innovation projects fail, if we change our curriculum, are we able to possibly improve those statistics? I don't know. We'll find out. But um, we looked at the literature on innovation processes, on team processes, and the emerging literature on design thinking processes. And a group of us that cared a lot about this just began to run experiments. Uh, we knew that eventually change would need to happen at the university and the department level, but we started very small. So this was our, this is how our engineering department would define itself um, early on. We began having conversations about what good design looks like that combines not only the uh, engineering functional factors, but also desirability factors and uh, viability factors from the business school. And we began uh, using a model that looked more like a human-centered centered design model. This was really novel. This was in 2012 at the time. It's very common, I think, right now. We also moved uh, from a division. The engineering school at Harvard is the youngest school in the university. We became an official school in 2007. Um, before that, we were a division of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And one thing that... Um, that, that, that means that we're relatively small in the, in the broader university, but it also means that we're kind of seen as experimental and given some permission to experiment. The demographic of our um, faculty began to change. Uh, someone like me was pretty 
unusual at Harvard before that, but now there are quite a few people like me who are younger than you might expect uh, or look different in some way. Um, we began to shift from a theory basis to a practice basis um, and to introduce multidisciplinary teaching in addition to research, which we'd been doing before, and beginning to include uh, design throughout our curriculum. So we did an audit of our classes in engineering and added more and more design to every class. Design not uh, in this sense as being defined kind of as um, product and service design, not, um, not like a architecture. Our staffing began to change, uh, and we saw uh, large shifts in student interest, not just from the engineering school, but also from the rest of the university in being interested in engineering. So these numbers are kind of staggering what this change was like. This is uh, our faculty in these areas of design, engineering, and entrepreneurship increased by 144% in, I believe this is about a four-year period. Our enrollment was up 500%. Um, and by, so that's by engineering concentrators and 142% from non-engineering majors. Our teaching lab space, so that's the space that we dedicate to supporting uh, I, student ideas like 3D printing, laser uh, cutters, et cetera, shop space, I guess, uh, grew by 367%. And we were using even hallways uh, to, <laughs> to accommodate these types of things. And our support staff grew substantially too. Most of that support staff is all going to um, helping students make projects. How do we keep uh, labs open, you know, even 24 hours sometimes. Um, so we see that kind of growth, and you can also see this graph is uh, showing the diversity of uh, student majors. So we're seeing a lot of interest in engineering and technology um, and, and our courses from around the university. So at this point in time, we are, I think, in probably 2013. And we uh, are ready to, to build this ecosystem a little bit more fully. Harvard is a little, is a difficult place for change in many ways. Once uh, the university decides to change, things can move very quickly, but it's a very traditional environment. And so uh, what we're ultimately trying to do is create change within a pretty complex and traditional system. And um, what we had to do was realize that these this, the buy-in for this had to be faculty-driven, and particularly voting faculty-driven, and that the administration would need to lend support to this cause, but that where we would really gain ground is through grassroots uh, drives and initiatives, and that those would be probably largely student-driven. So around that time, we're growing a student community and political support in the university. And this started with pretty small signals. Um, and we often considered those weak signals, but we would try to work together to uh, support those. So these are little experiments that students uh, are doing, like starting a student-led conference in design. Um, and how do we give them just a little bit of money and a little bit of space to be more successful with that? and faculty wanting to create new types of courses, um, like a medical device design course that pairs surgeons uh, who know the need very well with an engineering professor, and the students are trying to create medical devices that solve the need because the surgeon doesn't have the time to build the, the idea. How do we support that type of class? to give that professor credit for that class and maybe reduce their teaching load in a different way. Um, so we started with these little small experiments and we weren't really, we weren't telling people to do these different things. We were just watching for where they're doing them and then trying to help support in some way. A lot of this is not with official, it's not with extra funds in any way. It's just with small re reallocation of support and then tracking the success of what they're doing. 
and moving toward more uh, formal support. So at this point, uh, we have the, the engineering school wants the concentrators to have an unmatched education, not, not really surprising there, but we wanted all Harvard students to become literate in engineering. This was new as a, as a departmental goal and for students to be immersed in design and lab life. So some of these things begin to um, show formally in the, in the lab website. And these begin to lead to much larger changes. So we started to get approval for new faculty um, in these areas, for new areas to be added. Uh, Human-computer interaction was something that we weren't doing in the engineering school, but it fits very well with this growth area, and we began to add that uh, specialty. So here, this is a, a, a simple way to think about how these transitions happen. So we would have new types of faculty come in in these areas of student and employer interest, and they would often be the people who would invent classes that were quite innovative for what we have, very integrated, like the medical device design example. And those classes uh, represented new uh, pedagogical approach. They're almost entirely project-based classes and, uh, and have a different, um, it's not that the professor knows everything that um, you're going to come up with. The professor is more of a coach or a guide in that case, which is fundamentally different. We took, uh, this is 31 different classes, and we added elements of design to them. And the way that we defined that was we added problem solving, uh, implementation, and verification. We added uh, prototyping processes and, uh, and the types of communication that in the research we know are important to supporting um, innovation. I gave you one course example. Another course example is called Design Survivor. This is a class um, that, in, in this class, the students do 10 different design projects. It's very, very fast paced. Um, and we often work with industry for each of those. So we would do a project with Under Armour, for example, and Under Armour would come and they would say, we're really interested in um, you know, clothing that has embedded electronics. And we just want to explore this idea with your students. So that might be one of the um, design challenges for this class. And uh, you, the students have about two weeks to come up with something really interesting in that space. And then we move on to the next one. And the idea for this is that not that the students in two weeks are going to solve this problem that Under Armour has been trying to solve for a long time, but that we can create a classroom environment of support that uh, can get the student to a compelling conversation starter. That is like a physical prototype uh, that can change the nature of that conversation with Under Armour uh, in a very short period of time. So an example of a student project for that challenge was uh, they wanted to experiment with metallic thread kind of woven through a, um, through a shirt and then to conduct uh, heat through, through it so that you could have like a warming shirt. This is an example of uh, pedagogically how that class is set up. So every week is a new concept, in this case, warming technology, a new case study. So we'll look at a case of where warming technology has successfully um, been implemented. It might not be in wearables. Um, a new challenge, so in this case, it was the to, to uh, uh, embed electronics in, in material. Um, they have a new team partner. These are randomly assigned, so the students get a, a diverse experience working with one another. Um, and there are always really clear constraints to what, it, what must be turned in in two weeks. So that helps keep the students from kind of getting paralysis of all of the possibilities. And um, these classes are also designed for people who have not necessarily taken engineering before. 
They're open to everyone in the university. And the key is that if you don't really know how to do, how to prototype in what we're doing on that challenge, you'll attend optional workshops. So we will teach you everything you need to know, but you might need to have some extra motivation coming into that class. Um, and then they present their work, often with industry guests, and then we have you know, a weekly critique of what they would do differently next time. Do you have classes like this here? Some, maybe. I think, I think this is not just in our context. I think this is really something that is fundamentally changing. I think that uh, we are at the beginning of an age where most of the classes in the university will be like this. This was an, another example from that class. Um, we often do a headphones challenge. Uh, we're actually doing one right now in one of my classes with Bose. Um, but in this particular case, we studied the song Happy, you know, Pharrell's Happy. <laughs> and, uh, and we studied, does that song actually make people a little bit happier? And if I think when it first came out, yes, maybe now it's been played so many times, it's perhaps a little, uh, the effect has been dulled. But we looked at everything like the binary time signature, um, the tempo, the beats per minute. The beats per minute are a little faster than a normal heartbeat. So even that might be just kind of making you feel a little bit more uh, alive in some way. Anyway, so we studied this song, and then they were going to need to create their own original song with a, an emotional goal. So if happy's goal is to make you feel a little bit happier, your, your goal might be a song that makes you feel a little calmer, whatever they wanted to do, but they had to be able to justify you know, what it is, kind of like that heartbeat uh, guess that, that is happening in, heart, in happy. You know, what, what is the guess that they're making and technologically, how are they making that happen? And then they have to make the headphones that the song plays on. So this is a prototype of some headphones. Um, these are functional, so that means they actually do play the song. They're not super polished yet, but again, these are two-week projects. These are 3D printed headphones. Um, here are a couple of other examples. So um, this one on top is in cork as a material. Um, this is a, these are some of the 3D printed parts. This was an example that is a headphone that comes on the neck. And I've seen a lot of different headphone designs. But it's a, it's a really fun way to learn and to learn um, the technology as well as the application. And then, of course, it's kind of extra cool that Bose is located in the Boston area. So we can often get executives from Bose to come and give students feedback. All right, so that's an example of how bringing in new faculty has given us new courses and new types of pedagogy. Um, and then that has put some pressure to support those courses. Uh, so we often have some uh, lab technicians or studio technicians that help in terms of being there when we're, like the faculty can't be available 24 seven for your uh, 3D printing prototype problem solving. Um, and so someone needs to be able to answer those questions. And um, Harvard and other places, I think, have, have, have dealt with that in different ways. Sometimes it's training students to become helpers in that way. I think that model works very well. We do that. And then we usually also have at least one full-time person who manages uh, the student helpers. Uh, and then that, so again, these are all small experiments, but then they're putting pressure on the bigger system. And so that, uh, people love it so much, they use it so much that all of the 3D printers are always backed up, sometimes they're breaking, and uh, so we need more. And then eventually that begins to put some infrastructure pressure. We need some more studio spaces to support this kind of... Um, 
this kind of work. Uh, and a big part of, uh, of that has been the, watching students' responses. The more of these experiments that we've done, the more students have wanted more of it. And that helps us justify uh, growing in these areas. So an, an example of an entirely student-led initiative is our X-Design conference. And this has happened every year since 2014. And um, it's, it's like a professional level conference. They invite executives. Often they manage to get very high level executives from, I don't know, Nike, Pinterest, et cetera, to come and uh, spend a weekend with students. And they do, such a, they do an amazing job, and they've managed to do it every single year. If you've been in universities for a long time, you know that's kind of rare that uh, a student-led initiative, as the, the initial people who led it graduate, leave, that it manages to actually continue for this long. So these are, those are lots of our experiments. The iLab we've talked about a little bit. The iLab formally began in 2012, but gained speed over time. Uh, and now we are in 2015. At this point, the support for these changes is pretty formal. And we began to get the opportunity to create entire um, master's programs, interdisciplinary master's programs. One of the first ones was with the engineering school and the design school. This is the master of design engineering. Uh, some universities create a lot of master's programs. Harvard is not one of them. Uh, and so this was really new for us. Um, and another was the Harvard Business Analytics Program. This is an online program, but with a, um, a residential component. So I can't remember if it's once or twice, but you do everything online. They have created lots of uh, cool ways that you can feel like you're together with the other participants digitally, but then you all come to campus for one or two weekends throughout the program. It's been radically successful. It's a really cool example of uh, engineering plus business school collaboration that is, um, in many ways, I think less expensive to run than if we did this on campus. And we have managed to give it um, enough of the human connection that students in this program are looking for. So that's a, that's a really interesting model um, because it's so different than our um, on-campus programs. And this is another one. This is the uh, MS MBA. This is a full Master's of Engineering and um, HBS Master's. I was on the core faculty that built this one and the MDE program, actually. But this one I'm very, very involved in. And um, this, this program it is about 30 students per year. So we have 60 students at any given time. And uh, the goal of this program is to train not just future CEOs, but also uh, chief technical officers or perhaps chief design officers with a technical um, slant. So what does that program look like in a little bit more detail? That's a two-year program. Um, students applying to this program have to have a technical background, um, and they have to have uh, two years work experience in a relevant domain. So most of them are coming from maybe a computer science background or an electrical engineering background. Uh, we have people from aerospace and a lot of different uh, areas that don't fit that. But they're all sufficiently technical, um, plus the work experience. And then in the program, they will be working on uh, real world projects that are specific to this program. They go through five full design cycles in the two year period. And by that we mean from having the concept of an idea to building it. Um, all of our classes are co-taught and, um, and co-advised. 
So you always have a faculty member from the engineering school and the business school. Uh, we have a, you know, a thriving mentorship network of past uh, alumni founders. And uh, our first year of the program, we weren't able to offer financial aid, but within one year of the program, we were able to launch a fin financial aid program. And this is, a, it's an attractive program, not just because of the interdisciplinary content, but because of the strength of uh, the networks that these students are exposed to. So Harvard Business School obviously has a pretty great network, but they also get access to the engineering school's network and this new program, the goal is that this new program will establish kind of an elite network of these technical um, entrepreneurs. And uh, we have, you know, HBS has over 100,000 um, alumni at this point. We also have some past um, successes that are really exciting to the students. And, and uh, it, I didn't know this going in, but over 46% of uh, our alumni have become founders within 15 years. So we already have a lot of success to build, and that's even before we built this program. So we're pretty excited about leveraging that. When we first started coming up with the curriculum for this program, we did another of those validation studies of what does an aspiring founder need to know? And this is, uh, you know, the, the responses vary. Everything from engineering management to product design to leadership. And the concept uh, of uh, when we were building the, the curriculum for it was that all of these students coming in are pretty talented, but they're not going to be talented in everything. They're going to be talented in some of the things and maybe need to learn some of the other things. So how can we set up a program that is responsive in that kind of way? So this is a snapshot of the curriculum, but a simplified version is this. So they have in their first year, it's largely business school um, classes, and the green parts uh, are custom classes um, where they're building in those five design cycles. So those are just for this program. Uh, and then in the second year, they are doing a little bit more of their engineering electives. In this program, design is central throughout. So it's an engineering and business school program, but design is kind of, you know, we don't say the word design, but it's throughout the program. Uh, how do students actually use this program? On the technical side, uh, they have different goals. So some of them come in and they want to deepen their technical experience from the past. Some of them want to bridge it. So maybe their past uh, studies were in mechanical engineering, but they want to learn uh, data science now. So they get to actually choose the courses that they want to take. And likewise, on the business side, with their electives, they get to choose the emphasis that they want to take, whether that's to deepen or expand um, on what they have done before. An example mix of the students that this has attracted, um, they come from a lot of different types of engineering, a little bit of from product management, and a diverse set of companies from SpaceX to Uber to uh, uh, Glossier, which is a beauty company, and uh, and many more. So we've been able to attract a really diverse group to come in, and that's a big part of them learning from one another. So that's the formal formalization of some of these programs. And then uh, we have been able to turn that into more formalization on the um, spatial side. So the engineering school is actually moving across the street from the business school. We're moving our entire campus, uh, and that we move into the new building in 2020. Uh, we've been building that building probably for five years or so. So in the same period, lots of little things, but gosh, where we end up at the end of that is pretty extraordinary, where these two schools are literally coming together. So evaluating our progress, we can return to, you know, where we ended up with the Harvard Innovation Lab, or where we started out with that. Um, 
the Harvard Innovation Lab, by the way, uh, spatially is in between the business school and where the engineering school is moving. So it's this real ecosystem um, programmatically and spatially. But we've also reframed a little bit the way that we think about this. We think of these innovation projects as not just an outcome that happens at the end, but a series of decisions throughout the way. And how do we prepare our students for a process of really uh, robust decision making in that kind of environment of uncertainty where they're really having to choose what they want to work on and take more and more responsibility for bringing it to life with a, you know within this ecosystem of support. So we've mapped out um, what are a lot of the factors that we think are important if you define these projects as kind of layered decision making. So you have not just the final uh, outcome, but you have uh, a variety of motivational processes that go into it, of cognitive processes, of building and prototyping and strengthening ideas, and social and organizational processes that support that. Uh, any course gets, you know, initially is considered a pilot and then moves into, you know, a deeper pilot phase and then changes in its first few years before we decide that we're keeping that course around. Um, and we track a number of things to see how we're doing. So we track individual factors like the ability to uh, create new things, uh, the ability to effectively relate and manage conflict with others, uh, and the ability to what we call deal well with setbacks. These type of projects are difficult, and uh, you will often find reasons to quit. And we know that it matters that people just kind of keep going. And so how do we, again, try to support that in our classes? And the experiments that we're running, um, how well are we doing? So sometimes we see that what we thought would work didn't work so well. And we track uh, different types of diversity factors and uh, different types of outcomes. So sometimes the project is a failure, but um, the, the team learned a lot in the process that can still be a form of success. Um, but it has meant that we have to rethink how we grade in these classes to, uh, to, to accommodate for that kind of success. So I wanna leave you with a couple of things. That it, from what we've learned, we've, we do a pretty good job, I think, of, of supporting students to come up with creative ideas. But we need to do more in helping them relate effectively on these projects and to deal with those setbacks. Some of the students do very, very well, but we lose some students along the way in those areas. So we want to do a better job of supporting um, those students. And I don't mean lose them. They don't leave Harvard. They just become a little demotivated in this area. Um, and we have a lot of conversations about how do we provide uh, really supportive and substantial feedback on these types of um, projects throughout the class. And those are a couple of the things that we are really actively working on. So I'll leave um, you with some takeaways before we open it up for questions. So this really started, again, with um, paying attention to these needs that were being expressed for a new economy, uh, for new employer desires and new student interests. And then we spent some time validating those needs and we brought in new faculty who would teach different types of courses and introduce us to new types of pedagogy that were really relevant to meeting these needs. The people who initially believed in this weren't really supported formally, but they kind of began to find one another and to track their progress. They tracked signals that supported demand. So the iLab from the very beginning tracked you know, how many people were coming into the door and from what part of the university. Um, we tracked different other weak signals and grassroots signals like student-led conferences 
and found creative ways to kind of move resources around to support those experiments early on and tracked the outcomes in order to uh, justify kind of more and more formal support for these. Um, and at this point, we have an integrated ecosystem, we have integrated programs, and we have integrated spaces. Yay. <laughs> OK, so time for questions. Who wa OK, who wants to start? Nice, the government's ready for change. <laughs> I would like to ask one thing. You mentioned in your presentation, also right here in these slides, that you track outcomes. May I ask what exactly did you track? So did you track, let's say, uh, attracted funding for the projects? Did you use some learning analytics to see how the skills of the students have changed? So the gar government is interested in tracking. <laughs> yeah, so you mean outcomes at this point, right? Uh, yes, yeah. or at the end of the program, for example, uh -huh. when the students have finished it. Yeah, and we kind of, uh, it, I think at the sm every, from the small scale to the large scale are kind of drowning in information. Because a lot of this is experimental, we collect a lot of um, data on it. So in the class that I currently teach, we actually have a little link at the end of class for students to respond to, you know, their quantitative and qualitative uh, you know, what did you learn specifically? What did you not like? What did you like? It's pretty brutal, actually, to read, but it's very um, informative. So I think even at the small scale, we're doing that, and we can then aggregate that. Um, I think the strongest uh, signals of support for what I think you're asking about is uh, is really students and funders. So. We're clearly doing something right because this we just we cannot keep up with demand. Um, you know, our on, on every factor pretty much we have increased fourfold in in this period of time, in enrollment, in faculty, in demand for the space, and I think that's a little that's hard to argue with. I think that's the biggest thing. We also manage manage to get. Uh, an enormous uh, donation toward the end of this that helped support um, that building. But yeah, I mean, uh, the, the community is more active than it's ever been in the time that I've been there. But I think, you know, the, in terms of tracking learning outcome, we are tracking that. We're not, uh, I don't think it's published. Um, but even, so I actually run a longitudinal program tracking this, and uh, we are tracking improvements in, um, in not only the quality of the idea, but the quality of the process. And it's a little bit of a longer conversation, but if you're interested in more detail on that, I'm happy to give you uh, what, we're, what we're learning from that. Hi, um, can you maybe talk a little bit more about uh, this particular uh, the issue of resilience and of mm -hmm. students getting demotivated and what are the specific things you do in those kind of classes, project-based classes, uh, in both the grading side and sort of support? Yeah, um, so I mean, I think the first thing we do is normalize it a little bit. So the first point of demotivation is usually when students realize someone has created their precious idea before. Uh, and it happens almost inevitably. And just letting them know that that's normal goes a long way. And then turning that into an opportunity to, um, like the fact that something out there exists is an opportunity for you to like uh, make your idea more specific in contrast to something else. It's very, very hard to create a su successful idea when there's nothing like it out there most likely people aren't really ready for that idea yet. And so, you know, I think a lot of it happens in uh, either one-to-one -one or small group 
settings where you're able to have that conversation. I mean, I can say that but it's to the whole class, but it's a lot more meaningful if we can interact in a kind of smaller setting about your idea. Um, another common demotivation point is much later in a project, they're getting uh, conflicting feedback from mentors on what they should do next. And, um, and kind of similarly normalizing that and uh, letting them know that now they're kind of getting to a point of maturity in their project where they're the person who should be deciding. And so, you know, every bit of feedback might have something useful, but you also have to learn when to decide not to incorporate, incorporate someone's feedback. About the fac faculty, you, you mentioned new faculty a couple of times. Uh -huh. um, what about the old faculty? So it's, yeah. uh, is it possible to <laughs> also work with them and, and, and transform, and transform them? And, and the second question is, how much is the pressure of Harvard on, on them, on you, publicly mm -hmm. as well? Because yeah. these type of things demand a lot of work on the teaching design, right? Mm -hmm. You have to focus on the students, on the methodology, what, on the feedback. So do, do you have the pressure also on publishing as well? So. Yeah, so I think those are, can I, I'm going to answer those as two different questions. So one, um, there's a slide where I talked about how we've integrated design throughout our curriculum. Most of that was taking what we're learning from the new people we'd hired, and uh, we could see that integrating kind of a, a, a project-based opportunity that has design in it uh, was one thing that they were all doing. So how can we bring that into every class? And most of those classes are from older faculty. And that was a pretty seamless process. I think they wanted to kind of update their classes, and we were um, really supportive and collaborative to help them do that. And then... Um, your second question is, um, you know, I think it's something that we're still kind of figuring out. I think we are at this time where there's more and more recognition that excellence in teaching and, uh, you know, the, the metric side of that. Uh, and we can, we can demonstrate that there's a difference between this type of teaching and this type of teaching is kind of changing the conversation a little bit. I don't know where we go with it, but it's creating an opportunity for um, those types of outcomes to be considered publications in a way. Uh, and I think it is probably going to take us a few years to know what the outcome of that is. Does that mean that we have, like our business school already is very teaching focused in their faculty, and they publish case studies largely. So does that mean that the future for us would be um, a faculty layer that is teaching focused and publishes learning outcome studies, or teaching focused and publishes technical decision-making studies? I think that would be really exciting. So instead of business cases, we're producing technology cases where you have to decide, you know, how do you build a ride-sharing platform? There are so many strategic decisions that have to be made, and I think that would be useful for our students and probably for other schools' students. Um, but I don't, I don't think we have that answer yet. That's how I think about it, though. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was inspiring. I'm pretty sure that students are satisfied with these changes, but how about the teaching stuff? How do you support them or, or how do you teach them or help them to make this transition from this classroom environment that you showed in the, in mm -hmm. the beginning and, and, and this, um, this new type of, of learning? So we, I think we've, we have a number of experiments. 
experiments in that that are ongoing. One that has been really successful is called Link. It's um, like a learning incubator where it's kind of like a lunch uh, conference, not really a conference. It's like um, we periodically invite speakers for lunch and they give a talk about their work and they're from all over, but their specialty is innovation and pedagogy often related to these new trends. And that's been a way that we gather the people who are interested in that because they come to these talks, but we also can do some knowledge sharing in a way that is not, um, you know, the new professors teaching the old professors, which might be a little bit awkward in some ways, right? So instead we're creating like a community that is interested in how do you, um, uh, identify moments of demotivation and design an appropriate feedback system uh, to be really supportive. And so we'll invite somebody from another campus to talk about how they do it. And then that also allows us to talk about how we do it in different ways. We also have a program called uh, the Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching that um, is just within the campus, but it's kind of serving that, that purpose on, on campus. And they are a rare source of support for uh, funding publishable projects in teaching and learning. And they, they have a regular blog and whatnot. So we are trying different things in that, and they seem to be working. Lots of people show up to these. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two questions. I hope the first one's quite easy. In your research, um, you mentioned did a lot of um, research in design thinking. Can you mm -hmm. share with us your the best book to read on design thinking? Sure. And the second one is I'm interested in terms of how much industry influence the innovation and the change? And what are the win-wins or how does the relationships work with the likes of Under Armour, Fitbit, or your mm -hmm. guest industries coming in to collaborate with your rich resource of creativity and ideas? Yeah, okay, two, two different questions. Um, so there's a new book out called Sprint, Design Sprints. Um, I think it's by someone, someone from Google X. I think that's a pretty good one. There's a lot, as you probably know, uh, on design thinking out there. But what I really like about this new book is it's very in very short, focused sprints rather than you know the typical project at IDEO, which is the most famous design firm in this space, is often three months or more. So it's a little impractical. Uh, so I, I really like that. So that's my favorite current book in that space. And then the second question was um, industry. And so uh, I think that progression also matches the arc of this talk in that it's started out as uh, small experiments, usually through um, people you already know. So I knew somebody from Under Armour and you know, in Connor Walsh's class, he knew the surgeons and then built more relationships. And so you can have someone come into the classroom who is um, friendly and you know that they have students' interests first. They're not coming to like harvest ideas or something like that, which I think is just a, an inappropriate uh, use of class time unless there's you know uh, some kind of upside for the students. Um, and that there are some current attempts to formalize that a little bit more, um, particularly there are offices that would like greater industry engagement and even maybe funding through industry. But so far, I think, at least for students, a lot of it is through personal relationships. And so in the design survivor class that I talked about, what I try to do, the initial brief is usually to the executive, uh, what is something that is, um, you know, a question that you don't have time to think about, but that you would find interesting related to your work? And so one company we worked with is called One Wheel. It's an electric skateboard 
company. Um, and they have, you know, 90% of their market is male. And it's a really cool company. Um, but the executive, Kyle Dorkson, he is interested in what one wheel, uh, what a, how one wheel could speak to a female market. And, but their company, you know, can't really justify spending time on that when 90% of their users are male. And so our students explored what would an electric uh, skateboard as a commuter vehicle in an urban setting for women look like. So that, that's their two week project. But what I like about that is it ends up um, the, the executive is pretty invested in listening to the students' ideas, and that's really the most motivating thing for the students. And then I also um, don't make the students work on that. If they want to work on a different brand of electric skateboard, that's totally fine. Um, but yeah, some of the ideas that the students came up with for that project were actually incorporated in their new product, which is the, the one wheel pint, which is a, a little bit smaller. The original one wheel was 25 pounds to carry, which is kind of heavy um, if it runs out of battery. So now it's smaller, it's a little more nimble, it's a little more female friendly, even though their market is still majority male. Uh, too many questions, but let me ask just a few. <laughs> sure. Uh, so question number one is, um, there are different courses. There are the core courses, and then there are courses where only one person can really teach that course, right? Mm -hmm. But for the other kinds of courses, uh, what's your opinion? Should uh, the same person teach the same course all over again, or should you have a mix of people uh, bringing new things every time and so on? So that's the <laughs> first question. And the second question would be, um, again, uh, you mentioned the medical device project mm -hmm. as part of the course, I guess. It's very cool to have people from, from let's say, medical field and, and engineering to bring together. Mm -hmm. But they do speak different language and they actually live different lives. So there is a conflict, potential conflict, in, and not just in communication, but if you bring that to the teaching stage, that could bring some insights that you might have. Mm -hmm. Could you share those? Thanks. Yeah, okay. So two two different questions. One is, should uh, the course um, be taught by the same people over time, right? And then two is, uh, how do you manage the kind of disciplinary differences in an integrated course? Is that right? Okay. Uh, so um, these types of courses, I, you know, this is a this period since 2011 is a relatively short period. And uh, for the most part, we have the same people teaching the classes that they created. Um, so I don't think we have a lot of data on what does it look like if that class gets handed off to someone with no experience in it. But it, we do have, so the business school has something called the field course and there's a lot that has happened in, uh, at Harvard that I didn't share here. So the field course is one example, and that must have been around 2012, 2013. And that is basically kind of like a design thinking course that was created for, HBS has like, I think 900 students per class. So, you know, to decide to roll that out for every single MBA going forward was a really big deal. Uh, and so that is an example of a course where many instructors are involved just because of the scale of it. And I think you just always have at least someone who has taught it before involved. And so that's how the information is getting transferred. Um, in practice, I think uh, a thing that we underestimate about these types of classes is that you're kind of creating an environment, like it, you're creating like a, a motivational environment uh, in order to give the students kind of the, to help them feel comfortable exploring such an uncertain space. And different professors do that really differently. 
So I do that in a kind of like um, uh, supportive, but a little bit pushy mom kind of vibe, <laughs> you know? Um, but that's not gonna work for, you know, some of my colleagues where they're gonna, they're just gonna have a different style for that. But sometimes that style can kind of be part of the course that's hard to replicate. So I think that's something, like currently, I am teaching two other people to teach a class like mine, and that's where I'm getting exposed to that kind of difference. Um, and then the second one uh, on how do you reconcile that? Um, I think just by talking a lot of, about it. So we in in the current class where I'm teaching two other people, they also they have a very different. Um, perspective on design than I have. And we didn't even realize that we had three very different perspectives. But the way that we've realized it is because students, when we go around to their project, they'll say, oh, you know, <laughs> Professor Gallos just told us the opposite. You know, so you're like, oh no, this is like, there's, there's something useful about exposing students to different points of views, but it can also be demotivating, especially early on. And so that gives us a prompt that we need to, we need to reconcile that um, so that we can have a more unified voice for the students. But we didn't even know that it happened until um, that surfaced in real time. Um, I think the other piece of that is usually the people who design these courses, they have an inherent curiosity for the other person's field. Uh, and that goes a long way. So, you know, Connor Walsh in that, in that example is just really interested in how his work can help surgeons more. And so that curiosity makes him ask a lot of the questions and do some of the um, conflict management in, in the classroom. If you know of a, of a better way, uh, let me know. The uh, student the audience is quite uh, loud, but you have to come up with the questions while I ask the question on your behalf. Okay. So I presume that some of them are now thinking, okay, I also want to end up being in Harvard in about 20 years and turning around the Harvard as a faculty member. <laughs> so what were kind of from your personal career path, the things where you would say, these are the, I don't know, five things from the time you visited Riga. You said the, about, what, uh, 15, 17 years ago you visited Riga uh, to the time when you are now turning around the Harvard. So how did it work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I couldn't replicate it myself, I'm sure. Um, but I don't know. I think the advice that I would have uh, is to... You, if you can identify questions about you know, the way that the world works that are really important to you and just study those, I think you end up kind of ahead of the curve a little bit because you have been really pushing yourself to ask, well, why does this happen and couldn't it be better? Um, and how could it be better? And just like that questioning and curiosity. So the reason that my degrees don't uh, look at that they're kind of all over the place is because I've been chasing questions, not really degrees. And so that has taken me into different uh, faculties sometimes to answer that question. So when I was really little, probably eight years old, I knew I wanted to be a designer. But uh, over time, I realized that the design, the type of design that I want more of in the world is inherently really collaborative and really problem focused. And that wasn't the default for how design was taught. And so I've kind of been going and learning from different disciplines how they think about the things that I care about. And then who knows, you'll be turning something around. I don't know what it'll be in 10, 15 years. Okay. No more questions? <laughs> Students, you missed the chance again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, hi. hi. Uh, I would like to ask about the student projects. Uh, sure. Uh, how, uh, how these ideas are generated? Is it like uh, it is a uh, homework for student uh, that uh, mm -hmm. he or she goes uh, at home and think, uh, thinks at home about uh, what, what it will be, what uh, he or she will design? Or maybe you have uh, any brainstorm s uh, brainstorming sessions in mm -hmm. class or maybe you have an idea bank where... Uh, uh, there is a uh, topics from research stuff or um, problem situation from I industry. Uh, yeah, so how these ideas are generated? We, yeah, those are a lot of good answers already. <laughs> uh, so we do all of those things. Um, and we also do some things that aren't on your list. So um, we will sometimes have sessions with scientists from around the university where they just talk about uh, what they think might be the commercial potential of their research, uh, and they you know don't really plan on commercializing it. So we'll expose students to to um, to some of the ideas that are just kind of kicking around uh, campus that they might not have thought about. Um, I think through uh, classes like I talked about, where we bring in someone from industry, and it's like, well, what's a question that you find interesting? Because that person has thought more about electric skateboards than anybody uh, right now. And so whatever he finds interesting that he's not working on is still probably pretty interesting and can kind of fast forward, you know, a, uh, a student's understanding of a new domain. And then just mixing students. Uh, we mix students not only across uh, different, different majors, but also across different ages. So that design survivor class has uh, everyone from freshmen to graduate students in the same class. And, and that creates, you know, sometimes the freshmen, maybe they're not as sophisticated in their domain knowledge, but the technologies that they're immersed in are different, you know, than a 25, 27 year old. And so that can be uh, really additive in thinking about ideas. Hi. Hi. And, uh, so a first question my, of mine is that, is there like any view from your side how the universities will look in the future, like the layout or the design of them, mm -hmm. like the basic program, will they be the same or they'll be shifted like differently? Because we were talking about how we can combine different things together, but mm -hmm. what part of like the actual views and stuff, from, for, for example, from Harvard? And the second one is, how do you see the like actual classrooms being changed? Because I saw some nice pictures of round desks and like group working, which happens in our school as well. But perhaps that's like one period, or do you think that will remain in like future, or it will become digital, and then everybody will be sitting at home? Like, are there like things around it? Yeah, I I think uh, I think a lot of these things will happen as experiments and then I, you know, if I'm honest, I don't really know where they go, but I think that we'll probably see sort of all of the above and then we don't really know kind of where the emphasis will be, but I think we will see more and more sophisticated online education. I think the um, Harvard's business analytics program is a really, uh, to me, it feels like a grown-up version of the MOOCs, the massive online courses, which I don't know if many of you have tried those, but um, I think they require sort of superhuman motivation to like educate yourself that way. And uh, social scientists um, talk about three different types of motivation. So intrinsic motivation is you're doing something you inherently love doing. Extrinsic motivation is the you know, grades or money, external rewards. But the third type is collaborative motivation, and that's just the other people involved. And so I think in-person education gives you a lot of motivation because you're showing up for each other. And I think that's the problem to solve for where digital education goes. And that's why I think what HBAP did is pretty interesting as they, just like those two weekends, provide that collaborative motivation. And they've also, that's made the students also digitally invest more in relationship building because they know they're gonna meet each other. So I think that's gonna happen. 
Um, and then I think probably in-person education, uh, like we maybe take for granted today, might become even more valuable and even more of a luxury. It's really a luxury to get to spend the time, uh, uh, you know, four years or more of your life exploring what you want to do with the rest of your life. Um, and the thing that I really hope happens is that that's not just four years of your life. So I, I think that we should move into a world where, you know, professionals go back to school, like kind of like a sabbatical, like every six or seven years you go learn something new or deepen your knowledge. How do we make that affordable? I think is a tough uh, question that we need to resolve. But I just think everything moves so fast. You need to be re-educated uh, certainly every decade, if not maybe more frequently than that. And I hope that we will move in that direction. Hello. So. Uh we all know that Harvard is a, a pretty special case when we think about uh, institutions of higher education. So my question is, uh, what do you think might be some of the challenges when implementing such courses in different schools, maybe with uh, smaller networks or mm -hmm. uh, resources? Yeah, I think a lot of the trends that we talked about in our case, um, yes, you know, it's true. Harvard is a unique place, uh, but these trends are happening in, I would say, you know, most universities in the U.S. right now that have some kind of, you know, technical side to them. So I, I don't think it's just Harvard. Uh, uh, and the network piece, um, so, you know, throughout my education, I've been at a lot of different universities, and um, I think universities, like, Harvard is the only one I've been at that works as hard as it does on um, keeping its network alive. And I think if this is going to be like one of the main value propositions going forward, more universities could, could invest in that more. Um, and to provide more detail on that, you know, every year there are reunions and they happen around, uh, around graduation. So you have, you know, the campus fills with people f for whom Harvard has been a special memory uh, of all ages at the same time every single year. And, uh, you know, I think figuring out how to pay for that is one piece of it, but you might also just be able to charge people for that and you organize, uh, you, you do the labor of organizing that opportunity for them to connect and reconnect and reconnect with each other and with their memory of that place. Um, they do a really, really, really exceptional job of that. And they actually start it when uh, students arrive to campus. So in their first year, freshmen actually just live in like a freshman section of the university. So they build this really deep, bond with each other and with the place uh, on the, in their first year. And they have their own like, cafeteria and everything. It's just, it's really designed for maximum bonding in that first year. And then they disperse in many different ways. And I, they, they're just masterful at really thinking about the people side of that and not just about while you're there, but for the rest of your lives. Uh, but they also have, you know, whole teams dedicated to that. Okay. One last question. Yep. Short, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned before that a certain percentage of students that are participating in this project are non-engineering students. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know, have you talked to graduates or even current students uh, what is their motivation for coming to this? What are they looking for? What are the benefits that they see on their side, if they're, even if they're not going into entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of our students, you know, regardless of what they're studying, kind of do aspire to create something ambitious. So if you don't call it entrepreneurship in a kind of profit-motivated uh, sense, but you call it creating 
something ambitious. I think most of our students want to do that in some way. Um, I also think that there's a, like a practical piece, like what used to be like when I was their age, you needed to have like a fancy internship on your resume. And I think today you need to have a startup on your resume. And so I think some of them are, you know, doing it for the experience uh, in this very possibly calculated way of where they want to end up. Thank you. And I think let's have a round of applause. For Thank you. Thank you.